Um, you guys can go, I think. <laughs> I can't remember. If you have a Bible, if you'll open it to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews 5. If you've had a chance to read ahead, you probably said to yourself, what is he going to do with this text? Because I asked myself, what am I going to do with this text? <laughs> this is the text that all people who've been in church any length of time go to and ask themselves, what is God saying here? So, as I prefaced it with such challenging description. I want to tell you that there is a difference between knowing and knowing. Maybe you would agree. Like, for example, uh, I know how to change the oil and the brakes on my car. I can take them off, put them on. Our friend James Hudson knows how to disassemble the whole front of the car and then put it back together with his eyes blindfolded. Okay. There is knowing and there is knowing. I know how to play the piano, okay? I can see the notes, and I know they align with things on this board, keys. But I don't know how to play the piano like others know how to play. So the difference, there's a difference between knowing and knowing. Wisdom is having knowing knowledge and seeing how to apply it to life. Wisdom is, is being able to listen to an engine and hear that someone didn't have enough oil in the engine. Okay, I did that once. Everybody should not do it once. <laughs> um, wisdom is listening to a symphony and know that the oboe is out of tune. Me, I just listen. Wisdom is the application of knowledge to life. See, in our spiritual world, wisdom comes as the Holy Spirit takes the scriptures and applies it to life so that we'll see and discern good from evil. And that's really important these days. In the next little bit, what we're going to talk about is this idea of growing up, becoming mature. And either we should grow up or we should sit down and think about where we're really going in life. Either we should grow up and be part of what God's doing or we should sit down and take an honest look at what's really going on in our lives. I think sometimes we just keep running busy, 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 busy. Today, the main idea in our text confronts our slow, slow, sloppy spiritual habits. The sign of maturity is not hours of study or service or financial prosperity. The sign that we're maturing in our faith is that we more quickly and sensitively respond to God as he speaks into our lives, both through his word and through others, enabling us to distinguish good from evil in the small parts of who we are. Well, this is really critical because of the culture in which we live. Our culture actively blurs the lines between good and evil. That's kind of the nature of it. it the, our culture actively blurs the lines. Good is what makes me feel good, what yields financial reward, what solves my heart's restless, troubled feeling most quickly. Those are the good things. It should not surprise us, though, because the culture is not rooted in the kingdom of God. The culture is not rooted in the scriptural premise that God has good for us. 
and instead the culture finds its roots in the prince of the power of this world. It's also critical because cultural, the culture blurs the lines in church. And even folks in church, wider church, even our church, are influenced more and more by the things of culture. Now, lest we get on our high horse and say that, you know, we ought to be defending truth, because I agree with that. Sometimes how we do it can be rather hurtful. And even Jesus, when he stood and talked with people who were not interested, was exceptionally gracious. The only people he was ever hard on, you know, those are the religious people. They're the ones he railed often. And sometimes... And the author has come to a point where he wants to challenge his readers to move from the shallow parts of the Christian life to the deeper truths about Jesus. But what he finds is they're not ready. He challenges them to put off the basic things and dig into Jesus in a way that we submit ourselves to this great high priest who stands in heaven interceding on our behalf, who's prepared a place in heaven on our behalf, and he wants us to trust him, and he wants to support us. But in our text, the Jewish community, well, they're they're afraid. They're anxious. They're hesitant. This passage, if you hear nothing else, is a loving challenge to get serious about Jesus and to pursue Jesus with our hearts and souls and minds and strengths that we'd love him with all of us. And I know that life is messy. And I know that blacks and whites, sometimes it's hard because we don't, things aren't black and white. But Jesus calls us to come to him and trust him with even things that are gray and fuzzy and hard to figure out. So our theme today is signs of spiritual maturity. The real question is, do we want Jesus' help or not? Do we want want Jesus to help us or not? Let's read. The author picks up in chapter 5, coming out of this theme of, well, let's start in verse 8, talking about Jesus. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered and once made perfect. Once he had gone through all the things required, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Then he gets to verse 11. We have much to say about this. And this kind of goes back to some of those previous things he was talking about, about Jesus, about Melchizedek, about listening with our hearts. But it is hard to explain because you you are, or some translations say, you have become slow to learn. Slow there is hardened not able to take in the information, not being able to use it. Slow to learn. In fact, though by this time, you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's Word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, and you get the sense that he's imploring these beloved disciples that he's talking to. Therefore, let us, almost a pleading tone as I hear it, Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that leads to death and a faith in God, instruction about baptisms or washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment, and God permitting, we will do so. Verse 4. 
It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away to be brought back to repentance. Because to their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Land that drinks in the rain often falling on it and produces a crop that is useful for those for whom it is farmed receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are confident of better things in your case, things that accompany salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you've shown him as you've helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end in order to make your hope sure. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. And that word lazy there in the very end of first chapter 6, verse 12, is the very same word in the beginning of 511, where he says, slow to learn. It's interesting how he bookends that. Slow to learn, not become lazy. Slow to learn, not become lazy. Now you can see, perhaps, why I said I'm a little anxious about how to interpret all of these things. Because there are great theologians. People like John MacArthur, who clearly say this is written to unbelievers. They clearly say there's no way to lose your faith. But then there are other people that are also great theologians. And they say, oh, this is a stern warning to the church. Be careful. Watch out. Some of them go so far as to say, if you sin, be careful. Because if you die in your sin, you'll be in trouble. Yeah. Somewhere in there is the truth, okay? Somewhere in there is what God intended to convey. This is a little bit hard to figure out. So let's approach it slightly different. I'll let you go find a theologian that you'd like to read up on. A place where we realize that we have a need for Jesus and we, come and we give ourselves to the Lord Jesus. And then we walk in the light that he's given us. But everybody's got to start. So if you're here today and you have never come to that place where Jesus enlightened you for your need, let me tell you, you are like me. You're a sinful person. And you need Jesus to come and cleanse that sin. And you know it. Now, you may have been in church a long time. But in your heart, you know that that you have always been your own boss. And Jesus is not it. Everybody starts somewhere. And where we start is with Jesus on the cross dying for my sin. Because I needed it. And that's the incredible grace of God, that even while we were sinners, he still came and died for me. So we all start somewhere. Elementary truths. Now, some would say that these elementary truths are from the Old Testament, Jewish catechism, as it were. Because we see them listed in chapter 6, verse 1 and 2 and 3. And he says, you know, let us go on from the elementary teachings about Christ. And if you look there, it says not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death. MacArthur said that was from Old Testament, from the sacrificial system. Other people say that that's repentance as in you've repented from your sin when you met Christ. And then the second theme there, from acts of death and faith in God, second is instructions about baptism. And the word baptism, if you have baptism, that's not quite the right translation. It's really washing. Because baptism uses a different word. But some would say, okay, washings, like Old Testament washings, you know, they had ceremonial washings. And that's kind of the basics of Jewish faith. But if you come to faith in Christ, you could say that it's 
baptism like I've been washed in the water. That's kind of foundational. And then uh, laying on of hands. MacArthur, from his perspective, he said that that was a laying on of hands on the Day of Atonement, where they put the high priest, put the hands on the goat, and then they slapped the goat and ran into the wilderness, and that was a sacrifice. And then they killed the other one. So the laying on of hands. But Paul said to Timothy, you know, you received the gift from the laying on of hands. That's almost like the confirmation that God is with you. And then that very same theme, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. You know, David talked about the resurrection of the dead, right? And judgment was all through the Old Testament. And yet we see Jesus talking about resurrection from the dead. We see Jesus warning of the second judgment. So whether you're an Old Testament person, you say this is that, or the New Testament where you say this is this, either way, it's still foundational basics to the Christian faith. And he says it's good to know it. You have to know it. But if you stick to that only, you're not really following God the way he wants you to follow. Because what he really wants is he wants you to develop in your heart this awareness of good and evil. Because good and evil is all around us. Good and evil pierces into us as often as it can. You know, the truth is nobody really wants to stay young forever. Everybody wants to get their driver's license when they're 14, 13. Everybody wants to go to college someday, right? Yeah, see, I got the head shaking. Everybody wants to grow up. Sometimes when we think of church and growing up, we think of attending church and reading your Bible and praying and don't break the big Ten Commandments. You know, if you don't break those, you're good. Confess when you do. Relax, you're only human. You know, you're going to sin every once in a while. Just don't worry about it. You know, those are some of the cultural perspectives. Give your money, attend church. Oh, I said that before, didn't I? Uh, you know, there are things that we do that are basic and foundational. Sometimes what I really need to do is I need to humble myself and say there's more to learn about right and wrong. And that's the second theme. Not only do we all start somewhere, but maturity means movement. Maturity means movement. When my daughter wanted to go to college, we tried to persuade her to go to cheap Wake Tech, and she wanted to go to a college where you get the full college experience. I was really thankful in my heart that she didn't end up going 25 hours away, She's only 90 minutes. Greensboro is close. She wanted the experience to be able to go and grow up because she didn't think it would happen quite the same way living at home. Haven't we all been there? We all get to the place where we want to mature and grow up and get on our own, do our own thing. Now we all go at different paces and it's not bad to come home for a while to enjoy the quietness of being in a space where maybe our roommate's pestering you all the time. But this maturing thing is about movement. And if we look here at what he's describing, when he says, you need to stop just dwelling on this milk stuff, and you need to get into this solid food. Now, those are words that mean like these descriptions of other things. In verse 13, he says, anyone who lives on milk being still an infant, he's not really talking about milk and infants. He's talking about spiritual development. And then he says, being still an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. Our author wants us to step to a different level in our relationship with Jesus, where Jesus gets to call the shots every day. He wants us to come to a place where we give Jesus the freedom to teach us how to recognize right and wrong from the inside out. That found. I also found it interesting, if your Bible's like mine and you look directly to the left, you find yourself in chapter 4, verse 11, 12, 13, 14. What does that text say? That talks about 
the word of God being sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to must give account. This theme here of solid food being for the mature, who by constant use, that they're not only acquainted, but they become skilled because they keep opening it. They keep meditating on it. They keep thinking about it. They let the narrative of the scriptures develop the narrative of their lives. And then there's that phrase, train themselves. Look at it there at the end of 14. It says, train themselves to distinguish good from evil. Train themselves. If you looked in the Greek, you would see that it says their senses or their perceptive abilities. It's from the word isotera. And it means senses. And it's saying that their senses have been trained by the scriptures to recognize good and evil. It's not just saying that they've trained themselves. It's saying that they've developed the sensitivity, the sensitivity to be able to recognize the nuances of good and evil. My mom, precious lady that she is, always seemed to know when, know when my brother and I had broke something in the house. Always. Like she could come in from having gone grocery shopping and walk in and see us boys sitting quietly on the couch. And her first thought was, what'd you do? She would come around the corner and the room would be silent. And she would be like, okay, what are you guys doing? And we were like, how'd you know that? Well, you know, I won't tell you guys because the secret, I don't want to yell the secret out. But there is something that we decide, that we are able to discern from constant use. Some of you even today have that sense about people. Now, some of us are sort of blockheads. We just take people at their word. Yeah, you said it. I believe it. That's good. But some of us have these antenna. And the antenna go up. And they like perceive things that other people don't perceive. The theme that he seems to be saying here is he wants us to be so in tune with the scriptures that we're bathing ourselves in it regularly so that by training and exposing ourselves to the scriptures and the narrative of Jesus in us, that we're able to discern to perceive what's good and what's not. And I don't think it's just so we can go, ah, that's good, that's not. I think it's so that we can go, that's good, that's not, I'm going over here. Or that's good and that's not, I'm going to put on the armor of God and I'm going to step toward darkness because I have friends there that are trapped. And that darkness doesn't pierce the light of Christ that's in me. It doesn't suggest that we ought to put that right and wrong and become the judge and jury for everybody else in the world. Because it says, look at what it says. It says, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained who? Themselves. And he's, he's training us so that we'll be holy people because if we're holy people, God will dwell in us. I think part of what the author is saying is we're to leave church attendance and simple service items and take a hard look at the cost of following Jesus. I need to take a hard look at the cost of following Jesus. I need to weave the truth into my soul in a way that I grow accustomed to hearing the Spirit of God nudge me about moral issues in my life. Maturity isn't condemning someone else's sin. It's submitting our lives to the searchlight of God's truth. It's loving people like Jesus loves people. That's a sign of maturity. 
A sign of maturity is being able to embrace someone who's different than me, who smells different than I do, who uses different language, who comes from a different culture, and embrace them with the fullness of Jesus' love because they are valued. Maturity is saying, I've got $10. I only need $5. I'll share $5 with you because God's going to take care of me. Maturity is generosity. Maturity is is seeing someone trapped in a sin and coming alongside not as judge and jury, but a sympathetic friend who wants your best. Maturity is seeing that we're so forgiven that we can't lay a guilt trip on someone else. Maturity is seeing the speck in our eye and how that speck breaks the heart of God so that we can come alongside someone else in humility and ask if we can help take care of the speck in their eye. Because I guarantee it's only a speck for them too. Maturity is this whole different perspective where God is in charge of the world and we get to live in a kingdom where God is in charge. In all the stuff and all the culture, it does not have to touch us. We can live in it and not be touched by the sinful who waits with anticipation that we would ask him for help. Maturity focuses not on them, but on us. But you know, this movement of maturity also comes with warnings. I think one of my fears is that I'll be a Judas and fall away. One of my fears is that I'll get lured by the things of this world that are enticing. You know, Judas, he had his reasons. And he was convinced his reasons were right enough to betray Jesus. He spent three years, three and a half years with Jesus miracles and healings and food and I mean he was he was there through it all he had his feet washed just like the rest of them earlier in this this whole text we see this theme of be careful that you don't drift away all in chapter 3 and chapter 4 there's this warning today if you hear his voice don't harden your hearts these are very real warnings And I would be remiss for us not to sit here and say, we cannot just rest on our laurels thinking that I've come to church, I've done my Christian duty, God should be happy with me, I'm going to go my own way. God calls us into his family so that we can live and breathe the life of God and then be transformed into the likeness of Christ, which is maturity. And if we flip over to chapter 6, verse 7 and 8, we see this picture. Land that drinks in the rain often falling on it that produces a crop useful for those for whom it is farmed receive the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. I don't know that the example there is really trying to paint a picture like you're going to hell. I don't think that's the tone of it. I think his tone is that there are consequences. There are things that play out. But there's also this incredible opportunity that we could be in a place that the reign of God would fall on us and that the maturity that he raises up in us would have this fruitfulness, this crazy fruitfulness that blesses the people around us, this crazy fruitfulness that blesses our families, this incredible fruitfulness that blesses our community that blesses the people we work with, even though they're a pain in the neck, but that the fruitfulness of Christ in us blesses them. And God smiles because we're maturing in our faith enough to know that it's about him more than it's about me. Verse 9 picks up, even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are confident of better things in your case. 
things that accompany salvation. God is not unjust. He sees and he will not forget. Verse 11, we want you to show the same diligence to the very end in order that you would make your hope sure. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. If you read this text and just hear, do good or you're thrown out, you've missed the point. You should read this text and go, wow, God wants me to come to him. And he wants to fill me with wonder and beauty and grace and glory that I would be a reflection of the God in heaven to the people on earth, just like Jesus was. That I have a great high priest in heaven who's pleading my case. Even if I'm waffling, and even if I struggle to believe, Jesus is pleading your case before heaven before his father. True spiritual maturity leads to fruitful faithfulness. We will never produce the same fruit as somebody else. Okay, let's just say that. We're, we're not like each other. Marsha is different than me. John is different than me. Godwin is different than me. We're going to produce different kinds of fruit. But we're all going to produce something that's in the likeness of Christ. We're all gonna have ministries that are gonna affect other people. Some people are gonna plant, some people are gonna water, some people are gonna weed, some people are gonna harvest. And you have a great role to play in that. True spiritual maturity leads to fruitful faithfulness, but it begins with discerning good from evil because we can't dwell in evil and see God's good. So moving to application, how mature are you? How mature are you? Would you say you're a one or a 10? I guess it depends on how we do the number list, doesn't it? If we say 10 is great and one is, eh, well, we've got room to grow. That's good. How mature are you? The author describes maturity as the ability to sense or perceive good from evil as you go through everyday life. Not just perceive it, but to humbly turn from it or to take Jesus' life against it, where Jesus' life is more alive in you. So here's some questions. What role does the scripture play in your thinking around good and evil? Does the scripture play a role in what your definition of right and wrong is. Now, I know that there are lots of things in the world today, same-sex marriages, drunkenness, divorce. Church is notorious for having divorce issues. Now, for some reason, we jump on the homosexuals, but we don't jump with divorce. It's kind of odd. We do the same thing in other areas. We really come down hard on pornography. Instead of gritting your teeth and fighting your way through, that you ask God for help. That you had this thing that's blowing up. It's on fire. You can feel the heat. And instead of saying, oh, I got to go get the hose, I say, oh God, please send me the emergency department. Because if we never find ourselves appealing to God for help, that's probably a sign that maturity level is low. And it doesn't matter how long we've been in church. What is God in his tender love trying to develop? Because growth has a purpose. God's design is that we would have a harvest of righteousness. You know, as I thought about this text, I laid awake this week thinking about this text because it was a hard text. And the thing that I really settled down on, if I can take my pastor challenge hat off and put on my pastor love you hat, um, is that I, I love you. And I love where our church is right now. And I know that we're a small community, and I'm okay with that. What I see is I see us developing better relationships. I see us trying to pray more. I see us loving one another with a tenderness and a closeness that I think is really precious. 
I see some of the meals that we've had have just been a great time to be with each other and listen and tell stories about how God is doing stuff or maybe just about how life is working. I've been really excited about some of the things that God is doing in us. Now, they're slow, and that's okay. And as I thought about this text, the verse that really came to mind was the one in Matthew 13, where Jesus is telling parables about the kingdom of God. And he says, the kingdom of God is like a man who's going through a field, and he finds a treasure of great value. And he goes home and he packs up all of his stuff and he sells it all. And he sells it all so he can buy the land to get the thing of high value. And when I see this text and all the challenges that are associated with it, really what it is, is it's a call to say the treasure is so great. The treasure of Jesus is so incredible. And I I struggle to know how deep and incredible it is, I tell you. That I am learning, I have so much to learn, but I'm struggling to see how great Jesus is. So that I would confidently, because of the high priest that, that Jesus is, that I would go and sell all that I have and trade it all to have Jesus with me. See, I think that's the call of Hebrews. That he's painting this picture of Jesus that is better than the, anything I own, this treasure in a field. The second parable, he says, the kingdom of God is like a man who goes through a field and he finds a pearl. And he says, the man was so excited, he buried the thing again. And then he ran home, sold all of his crap. And then he came and he found the people who owned the land and he bought the land so he could have the pearl. But I find myself holding on to all this stuff because I'm afraid that Jesus won't be able to replace it. And I think that's the essence of what the writer of Hebrews is trying to convey. And he's saying, folks, leave the the elementary stuff. You know it all. You know about repentance. You know about the baptisms. You know about judgment. You know about the resurrection. What do you know about Jesus? Because if you discover Jesus is that incredible, all the other stuff will find a place. But if you chase all the other stuff, it's not long before Jesus stops being interesting at all. You know, I don't don't know where you are today. But I I know that I have been struggling and continue to struggle. I think I'll always struggle to love Jesus with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. But I'm praying that God would cultivate in me an awareness of God's presence that is, that is abiding and fruitful. I just don't know what it all looks like. I pray the same thing for our church, that we would be abiding and fruitful and that God would bring us people and that we would love them and serve them and see them come to know Christ like we know Christ. And that it would be exciting to see what God's doing in us because God is big and we're just people doing what he asks pointing at Jesus and saying you know Jesus can change your life he's changed mine Jesus can change you he's changed me and as we close there are a couple of papers up here this one says we've been trying to do something a little different at the end of service and this one says be prayed with if you're here today and you'd like someone to pray with you to share a burden and pray with you, or you'd like to have someone pray for you that you would have healing in your life. We want to believe God with you. On this side, it says, pray alone. Sometimes we want to come and we just want to pray before God and just confess and lay ourselves before the Lord and just pray by ourselves where we're not nervous somebody's going to come up and put their arm around us and make us talk. I mean, you've been there. I've been there. Like, don't bother me. I'm praying. This is a good place. But if you say, I just want to be prayed for, I want somebody to put their hands on me and I want them to pray for me, but I don't want to talk about my stuff. Would you come and sit in the front? The most important thing about today is that we would come and say, God, I need you to help me. I want you to move me out of the elementary 
into the deeper parts about who Jesus is. Now, I don't know what that takes for you. I don't know. I know for me, usually it takes crises. My wife, very uneasy, so if you plug your ears, I'll listen. But, so thankfully, God, and I said to her, I have no idea where all this money came from. But thank you, Lord, for giving it to me. So I'm throwing this on debt because I want this debt to go. And we still have like $4,000 in the bank. Like, this is nuts. Like, this is just not my, for three years it's been like, okay, where are we going to eat? Okay, it's like, like, this is great. So I get this call to the mechanic, not James. It would have been nice if it was you, but. Um, he says, yeah, we got, uh, my car, my blue Sentra had this little miss thing. It was like cylinder two, and some, he said, the, the, the cylinder, the spark plug wasn't screw, screwed in quite right. And I said, oh, okay. And so he fixed that, and I got it back, and it still ran terrible, just terrible. So I call him, and he says, oh, we found water in your oil. Water in the oil means you blew a head gasket. Blow a head gasket means you got to clean off the whole top of the engine. And you have to send it out. And I said, well, how much is that going to be? I said, it'll be like $800. $800. Inside, I'm going, Lord, I'm trying to get out of debt here. I don't know what you think you're doing. And so Ruby will tell you that, like, the office atmosphere changed. I mean, this is how stupid I am, okay? God has gracefully given me all kinds of resources that I can be blessing other people. And that he's helped me put some money on debt that I never thought I'd be able to liquidate that fast. And I get this $800 bill for a car that I spent $3,000 on. And my life is falling apart because, you know, six months ago, I had no money, okay? And I would have trusted God to take care of me. Now I've got some money, and now I'm fearful as all get out that I'm not going to have enough. Okay, so I'm just telling you, this is the reality that I live in. I'm messed up. Okay? So when I say that, like, I don't know what it'll take for you. But for me, like, there are these crises that go on. But I want to tell you, I confess that I agreed, Lord, you are right. I don't need to be afraid of this money thing. And I can believe that you're going to take care of our family. And you're going to take care of my kids. And you're going to take care of my wife and all the stress that goes with her job. And you're going to have to take care of the church. You're going to have to take care of these elders we have. Because Lord knows they're crazy and need help. And you're just going to have to take care of us all. Okay? But what I'm saying is... The kinds of things I'm proposing about Jesus being more means that we're going to go through crises and challenges. Like, that's to be expected. We're in this world, and in this world we're going to have trouble, and greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And so as you're going about your day, realize that the troubles you have, that they're not... They're not punishments per se, which is not to say that there aren't some pieces of that, that God's correcting us, and that's kind of part of what he does. But they're gifts for us to trust him more fully and to step into the learning sphere where I'm humbled and I'm needing God to help me. You know, I don't know where you are, but if you want to come pray by yourself, come pray. If you want someone to pray for you, put their hands on your shoulders and pray as God leads through his Holy Spirit or you want to have someone pray with you where you talk about your trouble or get healed, we're going to, worship team's going to come, we're going to sing. And I know that I've gone a little long, um, and I do apologize for that. But we're just going to pause here before we all run out, go to our 